in the grim dark future, there is only inspiration taken from the Dune universe. Warhammer 40k is an incredible universe in itself. As a sci-fi opera, it takes inspiration from many different universes and is sort of like an amalgamation of every single, like even from history down to other modern sci-fi universes. And I've had many questions asking about uh, Warhammer's inspiration and I think particularly as a time recording, the biggest one to talk about now is the Dune universe. If you're not familiar with it, it's a fantastic piece written by Frank Herbert. And today I'm going to go through the Warhammer 40k universe and tying it to all the pieces of inspiration that it took and built upon from Dune. The first piece I'm going to talk about is perhaps one of the greatest parts of both universes, which is the God Emperor of Mankind. Now, in the Warhammer universe, the God Emperor of Mankind is a man who possesses psychic abilities. He was born early in humanity's prehistoric era in a region of Anatolia, which is in modern-day Turkey. And the Emperor possessing psychic abilities, or basically magic, would become a perpetual, he'd basically be immortal, and he would go on to eventually forge the early Imperium of Mankind, which is the modern day equivalent in Warhammer, which is the Imperium of Man in which he sits immobile upon the Golden Throne of Terror. Now the Emperor himself was a very interesting character because he remained mostly in the background of most of humanity's history. He saw the rise and fall of many different civilizations of mankind, he saw it spread out through out the stars and eventually he would only rise to the forefront in the 30th millennium in the Warhammer timeline to which he would don the title the Emperor of Mankind. People who, some characters who have spoken about his early origins say he went by the name of Neoth, although even if this is his true name we do not know, but he would take on this role of being this Emperor. And it would only be later when the events of creation, creating the Primarchs, so his demigod sons, and then the subsequent Horus Heresy War that ended up with him being mostly wounded and broken and being interred upon an ancient piece of technology called the Golden Throne, which sits on Terra, which is Earth. And for the next 10 millennia, the Emperor of Mankind would be immobile, sitting in a state between life and death. A thousand psychers are sacrificed every day just to keep him alive and powering the Astronomicon, which is like a gold star, uh, sorry, a uh, beacon lighthouse within the uh, travel dimension or hell dimension called the Warp. Now, this is a direct link and taken inspiration from the character, which is later the second, which is also. At the time of modern 40k, he was called the God Emperor of Mankind, and Leto II in Dune is called the God Emperor of Mankind as well. Now the story of Leto, although I will say going forward there will be spoilers for the Dune universe, so if you are perhaps not wanting to hear any spoilers, obviously try and maybe watch this uh, at a later time, but Leto II is the son of one of the main characters of the early Dune books, which is Paul Atreides. Leto is Leto Atreides himself, named after his grandfather, uh, Duke Leto Atreides. Lots of Atreides. <laughs> and Leto II would be born in a time in which it's, again, spoilers ahead, in which Paul Atreides essentially rises to the throne of the Imperium. As many can see, there's a, both universes, there is an Imperium of Man. And when Paul becomes Emperor, he eventually does step down within his... Uh, Paul, Paul's story is quite long and... Uh, there's, again, don't want to go too much spoilers on Paul's story, but eventually Paul would step down from the role of being Emperor of the Imperium. And later the second's journey is in which he would enter into the uh, the dunes of Arrakis, the planet in which most of the dune story takes place on, and he would drink in something named the Spice Melange, or he would awaken a sort of his prescient powers. We'll go through more about the links of prescient powers and Spice Melange later, but for the main part of Leto's story, he would 
take on this mantle and role in which he has to enact a grand plan to sort of save the species, something that Paul Atreides tried to run away from. And Leto would combine with um, the sort of young and like the slug like worms of the, the small babies of the big sandworms that roam across all of Arrakis and it would eventually turn him into this god emperor of mankind figure which over millennia as he enacts his rule he would sort of turn into this worm his body would be like his legs would be sort of, uh, swallowed up and dissolved within this growing body as his body was consumed by this uh disgusting bio uh bi organic disgusting organic sort of shape Leto would rule over a period of time in which he would sort of change the fate of humanity and into which he would eventually lead into a plan which something is called the Golden Path and Leto would eventually die to a descendant of the Atreides house later and that would end the millennia of the tyrant god emperor of mankind's rule within the Dune universe. The second piece of inspiration that is extracted into the Warhammer universe would be the Jihad or slash the Great Crusade. Now, within the Dune universe, in Paul Atreides' time and his story, he would eventually unite with the Fremen people who are the natives of the planet of Arrakis. Um, and in his time uniting the Fremen, he would see visions of what would be the Great Jihad, which would be the sort of cult that would spawn from them believing that he was some kind of messiah figure. Now, bearing in mind if Paul was a messiah figure or not, these Fremen do end up following him, and in his rise to the uh, being of the emperor of the Imperium of Man, they would go out into the stars and begin this great purge in the name of their messianic figure. They would conquer or re almost reconquer the Imperium of man and it would all be some it's, it almost fell out of control of Paul Atreides it was something that he saw would happen and he didn't even know if he could stop it now within the Warhammer universe this is directly taken into the Great Crusade which has a slightly different tone within the Warhammer universe where the Emperor of Mankind within Warhammer he would create the Great Crusade because he wished to reunite the lost colonies of mankind across the stars. Mankind itself, within this 30th millennium, you know, 30,000 years, it had once been united, but then it had been fractured over the millennia due to war and instability. And from terror, it would start with the Terran Unification Wars and then creating an army of super soldiers, the Space Marines. The Emperor would go on to conquer the galaxy, to unite them all under one banner, one Imperium of Man. And between the two of them, the Jihad is very much more of a something, a plot which seems to go out of the control of Paul Atreides, as it sticks within the theme of Dune, which we will be talking about later in this video. Whereas the Great Crusade was something directly steered by the Emperor of Mankind. But again, they sort of take on a tone of like a... In, an, in a way, there's great spreading out of a almost in-universe. It will be considered a religious war much later on, the Warhammer universe. And they would eventually just sort of, con you know, the, the big conquest or, you know, a great suffering of the galaxy. Even in the Warhammer universe, I think in, in Dune it said billions died and Paul almost said he could do nothing about it. The Emperor of Mankind, in his Great Crusade, knew that billions would die, but for them to achieve compliance over the Imperium of Man, all was willing to be done. Another small point I would do wish to add on, which was at the time in the Great Crusade of the Warhammer 40k, there's a small link to some early lore where it talks about the gene cult of Luna. Luna being our very own moon above Terra Earth, and it's sort of implied that it takes a sort of inspiration from the um, Bene Talaxu, which is another faction that's within the Dune universe. And the Bene Talaxu, they're kind of their own things, so I won't go into them too much, but they should be showing up in some of the more recent media um, representations for them in the Dune movies. The Bene, Te the Bene Talaxu are sort of a humanoid race, and they specialize in 
genetic growth and um, genetic sort of purity and sort of achieving super soldier or you know, chosen materials and as a chosen genetic traits and it's very much a inspiration taken there when in Warhammer Universe they were creating these space marines it had links to Amar Asartes, who was a scientist who worked with the Emperor of Mankind within Warhammer, with some of the gene labs of Terra. Some of them were conquered very early on as well to work with the Emperor to sort of mass manufacture this space marine super soldier army. The Bene Talaxu in Dune, they often created things like Golas, which are sort of upgraded slash robotic humanoid hybrid humans they had like robotic eyes they described but they are very much like grown you know vat grown human uh hybrid and sort of super soldier bodies and they have like a sort of great link there there's another very small point which i can't get into too much unfortunately which is the ben intellects who have something called their axolotl tanks which were um one of the more like sort of grim dark inspirations i think it was taken in another direction in a warhammer story which the axolotl tanks were essentially meant to be the female uh, Bene Tailaxu. It was this uh, genetic purity, you know, ordered society. And to make these golas, or even something called, we'll speak about later, called face dancers, which are assassins, they would grow them within essentially the, you know, lobotomized female Bene Tailaxu. And uh, as for many people called, who are Warhammer fans, they'll probably might see a sort of twisted link to something called the Demunculaba, which unfortunately I can't get into today because um, Luton, who's a great, another creator on this uh, YouTube platform, he's done a video on the Demunculaba. Again, it's not it's not for the faint of hearted, but it's a great sort of inspiration there in which it sort of takes that Bene Telaxu axolotl tanks and then gives it a uh, demonic twist. A, another piece of inspiration taken from the Dune universe would be the Fish Speakers. The Fish Speakers were an elite female guard for the God Emperor uh, Leto II. They acted as his assassins, his bureaucrats, and essentially his elite. They were incredibly strong. They were all female order. Very, very important on that piece there. And they show up many times within sort of the Dune books. They even do play a role in sort of the downfall of the eventual God Emperor of Dune later the second, you know, the Worm God. And the inspiration in the Warhammer universe here would be something called the Sisters of Battle. The Sisters of Battle, very much in their aesthetic and general way they behave within the universe. So the, sorry, just to finish off, the, spit, the uh, fish speakers themselves were also part of the cult that sort of developed around the god emperor of dune so they did worship him as a god and the sisters of battle in the one the 40k universe are very much in that same vein in which they worship the emperor of mankind who sits immobile upon the golden throne uh, the sisters of battle are very much the militant arm or something called the ecclesiarchy which is basically the church and the, you know the massive organization that spreads throughout the e modern imperium of mankind in the 41st millennium the sister battle were formed from something called the brides of the emperor which was a small plot i can't go into uh, all the detail but essentially it involved a uh, sort of corrupted member of this ecclesiarchy who would take over nearly take over the entire imperium and eventually these brides of the emperor who are sort of a very fanatical cult they eventually end up become the militant arm of the ecclesiarchy because within the wording of the ecclesiarchy they said no men shall bear arms for this organization but therefore the women could and this was the formation of the sisters of battle uh hopefully i'm showing some artwork into the uh sorry the, the uh, side here which will show sort of how their armor is dressed up obviously like the sort of female monastic order Another great piece of inspiration taken from the Dune universe would be the Butlerian Jihad. Now this sort of gets into the more mystic and older parts of the Dune universe lore. It's not as obvious within sort of the films or the books, but it leads on to the fact that within the Dune universe, they don't like the use of AI at all. In fact, there was an entire revolt against the idea of using AI. 
and this would lead to the creation of things like Mentats and the Navigators in which essentially hybrid or modified humans are turned into sort of our versions of machines so Mentats are able to do like calculations in their heads there's even parts of the Dune trailer we saw one of the um, members of the Atreides household when he like his, his eyelids go up in so his eyes go up into the back of his head it's showing him doing like a calculation Mentats are very much a 40k takes his inspiration in particular from Mentats in another form as well but the Butlerian Jihad was I believe it also may be called the War of Iron as well I have to double check that but within universe they essentially did have to fight the machines and they had there was much more of a f emphasis on like a philosophical rebellion against the idea of using machines because uh, they were seen as impure or like they were soulless and even to the modern dune timeline the, the idea of like each human containing a soul is like precious and in the warhammer universe this leads into the inspiration which is the cybernetic revolt now the cybernetic revolt within the warhammer universe was an event that occurred i believe in the sort of early to mid 20 20th millennia sorry 20,000th millennium, so 20,000 years, and this was basically a rise of the Men of Iron, which were essentially like another, very much like sort of if anyone's imagining Terminator, it's very much that, where the machines that we relied upon essentially turned against us, and it even took allies from other like alien races to help basically bring humanity back on the brink. It was a brutal war in which from then on, human, humanity would rename uh, artificial intelligence into abominable intelligence, very much like sort of Mentats and uh, Navigators that we'll get onto soon. The use for which AI was needed was now filled with uh, a human uh, sort of representation. So particularly in the Warhammer universe, we have something called Servitors, which are sort of the floating skulls as a human brain fixed like with the machine parts and essentially is turned into the sort of helpers and calculators and everything that would require like a normal sort of AI use or you know anything beyond a certain point of machine intelligence has been hybridized with human you know biology and it's it takes that inspiration there within the Warhammer universe. Another great piece of inspiration that was taken was the navigators. So within the, you know, these both of these two great space operas, traveling around space is a massive, massive deal. Obviously, getting between planet and planet, such as within Dune, just originally where the Atreides house uh, lives on. I think it's the sea that Caladan, I think I remember the name of the planet. Uh, they eventually have to travel to Arrakis, and they use something called the navigators. Now, the navigators within the Dune universe are uh, special, like genetically altered humans that sort of live in these vats they kind of look horrific and disgusting at points and the navigators are the only ones who are able to sort of traverse space in a sort of incredible uh speed again like there's no use of ai within both of these universes because it's seen as heretical in some capacity so they have to use like a sort of human uh sort of interference there and the navigators in the Dune universe would go on to form like part, or they're part of something called the Navigator Guild, which is essentially controlling all of travel around the galaxy, and it's very much what the both Imperiums rely on heavily. Navigators themselves are a they, they use the way they created them was a, sort of immersing them in a high level of something called the Spice Melange, which I mentioned earlier at the beginning, which is what. Um, the Emperor later the second used to sort of awaken sort of powers in his mind and sort of accept his path of becoming a god emperor. The Spice Melange itself is, again, it's very much its own sort of, there's a big topic in there, but it's a, it's something that is formed on the planet of Rakis, which is where most of the Dune story is set. And Spice Melange has incredible powers in terms of it works as powering all space travel it's powers to machines but it also enacts as a sort of device where people can also get prescient abilities or slight powers but we will again go into that a little bit later in this video but for the 40k version of this we also have navigators now navigators in warhammer 
are similar but yet different in certain ways. Navigators in Warhammer traverse something called the warp, which is they have to get around without... Um, they don't use conventional space travel, so within the Dune universe they travel within space, whereas Warhammer travels within a dimension called the warp. Essentially the warp is basically like heaven and hell smashed together, and when humans are able to like enter this dimension, it's, it's basically full of sentient um, thought. The entire realm is filled with like little splashes, it's like a, a well of sentient um, ideas, demons, angels, all like concepts as well. But to travel within the warp, so if you only traveled say a few weeks within the warp, you could end up on the other side of space. It's a way to get around space faster, the Imperium of Mankind relies upon it heavily. Navigators themselves are something that was genetically engineered within the Warhammer universe in the 20th millenniums, and they essentially are humans but who have developed a third eye that sits on their forehead. The third eye is able to sort of stare into the tides of madness that is the warp, and they're able to sort of guide ships. They, like the navigators in the Dune universe, they sort of implant themselves within like special thrones within ships, and they're able to guide or travel within the warp uh, tides. And particularly with navigators in 40k, the difference they show between the Dune ones is that the Dune navigators are very much sort of they, they come out immediately as these sort of twisted creatures that are like human in a way, whereas navigators can look quite human, but eventually just stare at, you know, it's that, that famous saying from um, Lovecraft, you know, if you stare into the, you know, I think it's sort of Nietzsche, it says like, if you gaze into the abyss, the abyss gaze back into you. The Staring into the warp too long does eventually turn them and twist them, and it, particularly like navigator houses, which are sort of treated like noble family bloodlines where they intermix and they marry for, you know, certain traits. The navigators in 40k do sort of end up like resembling the navigators of Dune, where they become in a way so malformed and twisted. Like some of them have secret vaults where they hide uh, members of their families in hidden away caches on terror the navigators of 40k because they're so ashamed like if the, if the great imperium knew what happened to them eventually and how they would look they would be terrified in fact many navigators themselves do end up the one of the few early onsets of the problems with their abilities is that they do end up going blind in their sort of regular human eyes but the navigator third eye still works and they don't actually have to consume any um sort of material like the spice melange equivalent in the warhammer universe now, another piece of sort of smaller parts of inspiration taken from Dune, which I find fascinating, which is the face dancers of Dune. Now, the face dancers themselves were a creation of the Bene Telaxu, which we mentioned earlier, the sort of outsider, sort of, almost, they almost look elf like in their depictions in art. They're sort of this very strange society which they have those oxalotl tanks. The face dancers are sort of humanoid creatures that are able to completely assume the, the like sort of their face changes they're able to assume the form of other creatures and especially humans although within the dune universe they there's definitely a tone around how there's something related to them being very special towards the end plots so there's like very very deep in the books towards the end times so the ending uh, sort of uh, sixth book, I believe, and the face dancers act as assassins for the Bene Talaxu. They often will kill their target, assume their identity, and it's very hard to discover that someone has essentially been replaced, or perhaps they act as like spies. And I believe it's in the earlier books where they mention how the Bene Gesserit, which are the uh, within, within Dune, Dune universe, the Bene Gesserit are like the female order where Paul Atreides, uh, later the second's grandmother, belongs to the sort of uh, special women only order, not the ones to be confused with the fish speakers or anything like Sisters of Battle. They are able to detect these face dancers through pheromones. But within the Warhammer 40k universe, we have something which is called the Calidus Imperial Assassin. And the in, the Imperial Assassins are something that was created more towards the end of the sort of Great Crusade era and something called the Horus Heresy, which is basically the great downfall of the Emperor of Mankind within Warhammer until where he was put upon the Golden Throne. 
the assassins, which are the Caldas assassins, are humans that are sort of genetically modified. So this is an artificial thing rather than being created, like say from the axolotl tanks, such as the face dancers. The Caldas assassins are able to mimic and turn into other people as well. Although I mentioned the flaws of the face dancers earlier, particularly because the Caldas assassins in the Imperium have no such flaw as being able to be detected by anything such as like a Bene Gesserit equivalent. So targets will never know, like someone could be beside them for literal years and then there's no, like even detecting them through magic or any other means, they'll be sort of subtly killed by, uh, you know, basically your best friend who's been with you for 20 years, but he was replaced 20 years ago. It's an incredibly scary part of the Warhammer lore. Now, a really big piece of uh, Dune lore that I wanted to talk about, which I had to, I had to let's say it to the kind of later parts here because it's quite a, this is like a massive spoiler for sort of Dune lore and it's a very a harder, big harder thing to sort of get our heads around, which is the kind of general theme and the more like deeper, you know, the, in a sort of iceberg, this is like the deeper lore that's part of both universes. And within Dune, this is called the Kwisatz Haderach or the Golden Path. Now, within the Dune universe, Paul Atreides is sort of meant to be implied to be the Kwisatz Haderach, which is someone who has great abilities, such as prescience, or if everyone has seen his abilities or read them in the books, it's where he's able to, like, to control people or see visions of the future, particularly when he inhales the Spice Melange, which has many a role to play in it, and it helps, you know, create something like navigators as well. So Spice Melange is quite a rare material and quite an important one. The Quidditch Haderach is basically a, mes a messiah figure. It's a thing where they Bene Gesserit, his mother Jessica, who was part of that order, they went on to many worlds over many millennia, planting the idea of like a, mes a messianic figure who would basically lead humanity into a golden age. He would be a genetically a genetic super soldier in a way. He would be something where he would be literally like he would be a the creator of a new religion. He would be something where and in Dune it's used as a sort of control device by the Bene Gesserit. But Paul Atreides in the Dune sort of fulfills the role of the Kwisatz Haderach. And is later implied as well that the Kwisatz Haderach is a messiah figure for the specific purpose of fulfilling the Golden Path. Now the Golden Path is essentially avoiding the great doom of humanity, which is something which will be a great I'm very excited to talk about the Warhammer part of this, where in Dune, they certain individuals such as Later the Second um, later is able to see this as well when he in, um, inhales Spice Melange. Him and Paul are able to see a future in which humanity was basically wiped out by like an external force or perhaps something where, in a way, humans are able to be hunted down and destroyed within a great, great distant future. And the Golden Path is one of the few ways in which humanity is able to get around this and the Kwisatz Haderach is someone who people believe to be Paul Atreides but it actually turns out to sort of be later the second the god emperor of Dune he or the god emperor of mankind he would enact this path where he would sort of join with the sandworms that I mentioned like at the very beginning and he would have to become this disgusting worm figure he'd have to live millennia to eventually breed into uh, breed a trait into his family's line when he played like master manipulator of setting up and you know arranging marriages he would have to breed a, a trait in which a person would be invisible to the power of prescient which means they wouldn't be able to be seen in visions of the future they basically could decide their own fate and particularly with characters like paul atreides he would be a slave to fate he would be something where like even with the jihad that was formed straight after his time as or as his rise to becoming emperor it was something where he he couldn't really avoid it where and he was able to be seen within like his own prescient visions his sort of future uh, visions of the future he was sort of on a path where he was enslaved to it and paul atreides chose not to essentially sacrifice himself to enact the golden path which was what uh, Leto had to do he had Leto had to become the god emperor of mankind to 
essentially create the right conditions and the right uh, genetic traits to allow humanity to then spread that and then eventually avoid this great catastrophe. I can't remember the great doom name within. So the great, they call it the great do, uh, doom, not to doom, the great doom within the Dune universe. And I think it's called Kralizak, if, if I remember the top of my head. And to avoid Kralizak, uh, later would have to enact this great grand plan. Now, within the Warhammer universe, this equivalent is linked to the Emperor of Mankind, in which the Emperor of Mankind be essentially became the Emperor of Mankind. He would go on to create 20 demigod sons called the Primarchs because he wanted to conquer all of the different sects of humanity to eventually avoid a great catastrophe. Basically, he wanted to avoid what would be the death of humanity within the Warhammer universe, humanity's version here of their Kralizak. And the war the plan for this was to essentially shift human to gather all the every single human within the Milky Way galaxy and to shift them into a, another dimension where they could be safe from the intervention of something called the Chaos Gods. Chaos is like a really big thing in Warhammer. Again, everything needs its own explanation, but essentially Chaos gods who live within the warp realm would eventually corrupt us, destroy us, and all of humanity would be lost to either aliens, infighting, or eventually dooms to fail like some of the other races in the Warhammer universe. And the Emperor's grand plan was to sort of save humanity by gathering everyone and shifting them into another dimension where we could be safe from that influence. It's sort of, they both have this link of like sort of a great escape they're not really a fighting not like a fighting back in some kind of way they're both just about survival and it would be this whole reason that the emperor of mankind became the emperor was to essentially save humanity and that's the only reason why again like the links there between both emperors figures is that they both don't really want to enact these great plans but they do it because they see both of them possess a sort of ability to see into the future and they see it as no other way around this. One of the last things I wanted to talk about was the themes of both universes. The sort of shared theme between the two of them is a theme of like absolute power when a character who sees visions of the future is sort of enslaved to them. Absolute power plays a role in both of them, but in neither way is both it's a strange thing in both universes because they sort of because of outside forces they are for both like even god emperor characters are forced to do something in which they both find it disgusting you know to be for the leto's version he has to enact a millennia long rule in which he basically sort of degrades humanity down to a sort of state of lifelessness almost people aren't dead but there's nothing to live for and so people would eventually when upon his death would escape and spread the special genes across all of humanity. And within Warhammer, the Emperor sees it as a way to sort of, this is the only way to fight against the tide of this inevitable death at the hands of Chaos. And they both also come with a sort of slight warning within both of them, which is a warning about charismatic leaders. So particularly in the Dune universe, Paul Atreides is not really the main character uh, Leto eventually sort of enacts that role as it related to the second apologies but they sort of warn you like both of these characters like Leto, Paul or even like you know um, the Emperor of Mankind within Warhammer they're all deeply flawed to some degree and part of even in the Warhammer universe the sort of doom of humanity is implied to sort of be the Emperor's fault it's in a weird cycle loop where the Emperor of Mankind so humanity is threatened by chaos because the Emperor of Mankind exists, but the Emperor of Mankind exists because of the threat of chaos. So it's a weird cycle there. And particularly within the Dune universe, it warns how like characters like Paul Atreides, they don't really know what they are doing. And they enact these terrible things such as the jihad at the you know at the rise of his own story. He's, they both fulfill a hero's journey, but then the hero's journey is not some grand fairy tale it's filled with blood death and misery and themes about people willing to do in both universes themes about 
people just willing to do awful things in the name of something they put their whole uh, belief system into and it can be quite scary particularly in the, in the modern 40k universe it it states it like the humanity at this point is the worst it's ever been and they believe um in fanaticism in ignorance and essentially it is the grim grimmest darkest future possible and the last thing to finish on here is actually a few differences between the two universes and the the biggest one i thought i would mention which is sort of the cultural angle in which it both of them sort of come from now within the dune universe like frank herbert he tackled the dune universe from a sort of middle eastern arabic sort of meshing of cultures from that region of our own world and um, particularly about the fremen we see that the fremen themselves in their naming conventions and the way that they express their religion they is a is, is a sort of melting pot of all the different things of that region in our own world and even in these cultural themes such as like you know the, they call it the jihad the kwisak haderach like lots of the naming conventions all tackles it from that point of so that sort of tone and that point of view whereas in the warhammer universe it's very much more of a standard Ro romano greco um sort of tone is there's often a joke in here like if anyone names a new space marine chapter it's probably going to have something romano greco about it though the amount of primarchs who are the sons of the emperor who have basically roman or greek influences on all of them is quite astounding and uh sometimes it can often be interchangeable at some level and the last big difference between the universes is that within dune there's not really magic or oh another one is they're not really aliens that's one of the big one there are like hints of things that could have been mysteries such as that but again it's explains like ancient human but the big one is that there's no real magic in dune now there is something which is basically the voice or the special ability used by the bene Gesserit, by paul by leto the second in which it's sort of acts like a hybrid between um like mental domination or like the force in some regards as in if anyone's seen you no know, these are not the droids you're looking for essentially that's the whole powers about it but it's meant to be more of i think the way they have described it within the universe it's more of a power like it's an evolution of uh like just human abilities themselves into which it's like an expression of like body language voice control like vo vocal commands and control so it's not like necessarily a ability that's an outward projecting although i may be somewhat wrong on that and but there is also things such as like they see you particularly when someone inhales a lot of spice melange and their eyes turn blue they can often see visions of the future particularly yeah, with paul atreides and leto they saw into the very very distant future or even paul was affected by her visions a lot and within warhammer there is very much magic although it's slightly different from the conventional sense in which i've always thought of magic within warhammer as a mix between traditional like you know wizard magic and sort of what is the force in star wars where there's a lot of particularly like there's a lot of like the telekinesis or telepathy like a mental side to warhammer magic particularly from like inquisitorial characters like if anyone wants to get into warhammer great book is uh eisenhorn trilogy is a great book to start with which explains a character who has sort of uh, psychic powers to like a very small degree whereas the emperor himself had powers to the extent in which the emperor could enlarge his size he could basically ignite a flaming sword he could use fire he could even i think at the height the emperor of mankind within warhammer being the most powerful psycho basically within existence could essentially almost make a sort of a miniature black hole in some regards or like a, he could teleport things into the warp he so there's and then there are often times when such as psychos use things like lightning or spells or not necessarily they don't chant in warhammer but again like the outcomes of like a fireball or things where you know magic is used there's a much more traditional sense of it rituals also enact power and belief is one thing in warhammer where belief uh, sort of warps the universe if lots of people believe something and the very very last thing i wanted to mention which was i think it sort of jumps on from what i said earlier about the tone which is 
the general settings message. Um, I mentioned it a little bit earlier where the Dune really wants to imply that you should be wary about leaders. It, it's to show like the you know the hero journey of Paul Atreides just ends up showing like this is basically the hero's journey and then what happens after that. And it's about not necessarily believing um, in sort of characters like this. Like they're bigger than just being human in some regard. Like they're both, they're all just, everyone is just people. And it's about not, humanity often falls into traps where we will follow charismatic leaders into terrible, you know, people can be misled into doing terrible things. And the Warhammer universe's general tone and sort of message is about finding hope in general bleakness. Grimdark is a very hard term to describe because it's not quite like I can't you can't point to something very obvious and say that is exactly what Grimdark is. But Grimdark has often been I would love to quote Dan Abnett, who's one of the uh, Black Library and Warhammer authors. He says Warhammer is kind of like there's no room for hope with a capital h but there's room for hope with a little h and it's to show like warhammer stories are quite bleak and humanity is constantly at the edge of survival but there's just a very very slim chance that very on, on the tiniest margin of slim chances we could come out with a pyrrhic victory and so it's a general like finding sort of that small piece to hold on to within a very bleak situation and with that being said i hope people found that like interesting because again i love i have loved both universes i definitely found dune after uh finding out warhammer so it was great to sort of come across all these like sort of things where i reckon like oh i've i know that you know i've seen parts of that within warhammer law and finding the inspiration for that in what was the earlier setting dune um it's one of the things like you, again like if you ever if you ever like one of them first or if you liked dune only you've come here just to find about warhammer both if you like any of them you can both just it's really easy just to leap into both of them if people have questions about the law please do put them in the comment section it can be small ones such as a like, very niche topic something you know generic and very like wide i'll be happy to answer any of them here on ask a lawmaster if you put the hashtag ask a lawmaster i'll be sure to see it and then hopefully i can make a video about it and we can discuss through your topic now the first question today is by Zenon, who actually messaged me on Discord. Thank you, brother. He says, "I'm curious on what your thoughts are on Nakona Sharakin, and also the theory that he could be Alpha Primus. It sounds like in Gene Father, he, in brackets AP, looks like a Raven Guard. I guess Alpha Primus looks like a Raven Guard, and can sort of also, uh, apologies, can also do a sort of astral projection." Which is, which is what many theorize that Korax is doing right now whilst being locked away within the Raven Spire. It's a great question, actually. Thank you, brother, for your question. Um, Nikona Sharakin, the reason, just from the law side, the at the end of sort of the Siege of Terror here, it starts Nikona Sharakin, who's one of the Raven Guard, who uh, quite rightly popped Fulgrim in the head with a armor-piercing bullet because he deserved it. Um, he is the last survivor of their ragtag group of sort of scattered legion survivors and Nakona Sharakin is quite an awesome figure if anyone doesn't really know about him he basically killed Lucius and he made him the eternal essentially because he killed him the, he's the first person to uh, put Lucius or the emperor's children down so everyone you know that's a big plus because he deserved that definitely and Nakona Sharakin was last seen um, sort of taking away secret, I can't remember the name of the exact um, ship or is it device he was guarding, but he essentially was escaping a sort of traitor's plot to use something from Luna, if I believe correctly, it might have been Luna. And we last saw Nakonia Sherikin sort of being hustled away and sort of uh, pushed away by like, Magnus, sort of saved by Magnus the Red, funny enough, who's obviously a traitor at this point or later. And Nikonia Sharakin was guarding a device that would eventually be used and part of the work needed by um oh my god uh, Belisario's call to create the Primaris project and I think the idea of him being Alpha Primus obviously Alpha Primus being the sort of the greatest piece of work that Belisario's call has created he's a space marine who's meant to sort of be incredibly special in some regards 
and I don't think it's a fair point. It could be like he was he it could be Nikon Sherikin, although I do believe it might have been given more clues if it was to sort of go with that theory. I think it honestly, I think it kind of resent could be possible. Although the idea of like him not retaining his memories, or it could be the fact that Alpha Primus is somewhat in way related to Nikonia Sherrick, and like it could be like a clone, or like essentially not necessarily a clone, but it was the Primark project slash genius project of Belisarius to make him from Nikonia Sherrick. I think Nikonia would be a great sort of building block for that, though. Although I I do have hopes out that particularly within the 40k timeline. I hope Nakona Sharikin actually returns to the 40k setting. He's sort of implied to be on stasis, I believe. And, or maybe he sort of helped Belisario's call with the Primaris project. I, again, I think it's 100% possible that he could, or like it was essentially, Alpha Primus is something built upon Nakona Sharikin in some regard. I do think they are linked. And that's a fantastic question there, brother. Let's hope it <laughs> becomes true because um, poor Raven Guard need a win <laughs> in some regard. And the next question here is by um, at Engineer of Vol. He says, hey, how? Hello, brother. Less and question and more wanting to know your opinion on the likeness of a theory. I forget if it's actually been confirmed, but Kegarak is most likely the culprit for the one who switched the places between the Khan and Fulgrim. Now we know that Jagatai and Fulgrim have a strained relationship during the Crusade era, but do you think this is set up for the return of the Khan right after the inevitable introduction of the Emperor's Children in the 10th edition? The last we know of the Khan is he is rushed into the webway chasing after the Drukhari, and as badass as he is, even he can't really navigate that place. It's true. Could it be that this was all part of Kegarak's plan to bring the Khan into his realm, the webway he knows better than anyone, and have him join his efforts against Slanesh and specifically Fulgrim? Now, that's a good question. Um, it is very much true, like confirmed in law, that Kegarak did swap places with Fulgrim and the Khan. It would have been quite interesting to see the Khan grow up on Chemos and then Fulgrim grow up, grow up on um, Chagoris. So, you know, basically Horse Lord Fulgrim. Well, I think it was implied that Fulgrim might have landed not near the Horse Lords, but he may have landed near um, the sort of Im Imperial um, tribe, not the human tribe, but the, the walled human cities, which were sort of slightly chaos worshipping. I think it, it might have been implied that in the law, but I do believe, like, particularly with the Khan's question, Kegarak has definitely played a part in it. It would be quite strange if GW didn't use that in some regard, although it may may have just been a thing where essentially Kegarak already has done his role in the Khan's and Fulgrim's destiny, in which he switched them, so so basically the Khan never would end up falling into chaos. But I don't know if necessarily like. Particularly, I think with Kegarak, who is the laughing god of the Eldari, his role is more along the Harlequins lines. I know the Harlequins can be seen in um, Komara at certain points, though. They may, they may have a role to be fair in sort of breaking. I think the Khan is possibly trapped within Komara. Maybe, maybe Vect has him. We never. Hopefully not, because that would be really upsetting. But I do believe, again, it's probably right that it'll be tied into Fulgrim's sort of return. It has been set up a few times where, particularly that great burn that um, the Khan gives Fulgrim, where he says, you know, I hear you do strange things to your warriors, and he gives them that heavy lidded stare. And we didn't really get to see the conclusion or, like, the big build-up between the Khan and Fulgrim of that moment. It's, it's just, obviously, they, they put it in there. It's a nice little piece that they need to kind of then... Um, you know, let it actually play out. Obviously, the Khan would end up fighting Mortarion a lot during the Crusade, sorry, the um, Horus Heresy and the Siege of Terror. But you're right, the Khan, I do, I do think it will be because Gilliman has fought Mortarion, uh, Angron and the Lion have already basically duked it out, and the Traitor Primarch coming back will have to. I think when the Khan returns, if he has to fight a Primarch, it doesn't make sense for like Lehman Russ or Vulcan to fight Fulgrim. So I think you're probably right, it'll be perfect and it'll be 
it might be like with the World Eaters release where World Eaters came out first and Angron came out and then the Lion came out in early 10th. So it may be like the, particularly in 10th edition now, the Emperor's Children will come out, Fulgrim will return, and then the Khan will sort of be set up as a, you know, I'm here to put Fulgrim in his place. And whoever poor sod has to be in that place with that disgusting little snake man. Um, but thank you for your question, brother. Uh, the next question here is by um, at Matthew McGee uh, 8029. He says, didn't Erda confirm or at least imply that Malkador was among the few perpetuals that stayed loyal besides the Emperor as he built the Imperium? Yes, this is a good question because Erda is obviously the Primarch's mother. Uh, yeah, essentially the only when the Emperor of Mankind was building his great Imperium, like laying the early foundations, he, over his lifetime, like even in prehistoric sort of eras, he, like all the Perpetuals sort of knew each other. It's implied that they've all sort of at least come across each other over hist over as history sort of would play out. And they, the Emperor initially wanted to have these Perpetuals be the, the generals in his armies the ones who would go out and help conquer the galaxy with him but slowly over time they would sort of realize like oh he's kind of a tyrant although he wouldn't explain some of the, his deepest plans to them so he doesn't they don't really understand why he's going this far and it would eventually be like oh again like only Malkador would stay behind I think it's possible because Malkador is I've had some theory I think I mentioned it in some of the videos like I've had a theory that Malkador might be like sort of he wasn't originally like how John Grammaticus who the perpetual he had to die first and then being resurrected as a human sort of turns you into a perpetual or an immortal like basically having your soul revived makes you immortal in some regard I think Malkador may have done it through certain very dodgy and horrific means which is implied to be his great sin I think Malkador is possibly the only one who maybe the Emperor shared some of his true intentions with it's implied that like Malkador knows like everything the Emperor sort of knows and Malkador essentially was the only perpetual willing to go that far a lot of them that we meet throughout the um, Horus Heresy books they're not quite like some of them are ashamed by some of the things they've done in their lifetimes but none of them probably are as bad as what the Emperor and Malkador have done so I think a lot of them just couldn't stomach what uh, Malkador and the Emperor were willing to do or like you know the, the lengths they were willing to go as far as they did um, but yeah Erda does actually say like yeah but basically they every one by one they'd all leave him and because of that the Emperor would actually have to create the Primarchs because he just needed super generals to win the galaxy for him and even Erda at some point when she left she um would scatter the Primarchs because she, she, I think she was one of the, she was the last one to leave, I do believe as well before. And the Emperor never took revenge on any of the, uh, the Perpetuals because I think maybe when you live that long, it's just one of those things like, uh, uh Alania's person, who's like the one, the first Perpetuals he probably ever met, betrayed him at some point, you know, in like the early, early, like early BC era, but he doesn't, the Emperor doesn't seem to hold a grudge with them, but they all just sort of do start to get picked off or fall away because of what the Emperor has done. Um, but thank you so much for your questions. Again, if anyone has any, put it in the comment section uh, below. Uh, hashtag Ask a Lawmaster helps me find it easier. Uh, I've been Hal, and thank you guys so much for watching. Peace.